So what would you say was that driving factor to be like, you know what, I'm willing to take another risk at this point in my life when I don't really need to? I think it's always been that way. I mean, for 20 years, it's like start a small company or be, join a small company. It gets acquired. You work at a big company, leave that relatively cushy job like that you could literally retire at. I was at yeah. Yahoo, at VMware, at Microsoft and like, you know, all great companies, you know, maybe Yahoo, not so much like at the time. But um, <laughs> like, you know, again, like there were there were very secure jobs, like very good jobs, well paying jobs. But to me, it was always like that. Go back to the startup and, and build again, because I really enjoy that part of it. I, I, I like the solutioning of like. How do you solve a business problem and use technology as a tool? Calm down before you stress up the groove. The energy a little different when the blessings are cool. Hey, who you talking to? Just know I ain't no regular fool. Could be anything in the world, but I can never be you because I had time like a moment. What is going on, Seed Frasers? Welcome back to another episode. If it's your first time on the channel, my name is Mo. I'm the host. And on this channel, we go ahead and host some of the brightest minds in Web3. Today, we got somebody I really admire in the space, Kevin Degons, the CEO behind Dust Labs, which is a tech company behind the infamous projects Degons and Utes. We go in and talk about Kevin's journey, some of the plans for Degons and Utes going into 2023, the transition of these collections moving to the other chains and Polygon and Ethereum, and so much more alpha about just building and coming from the Silicon Valley space into Web3. So I really like this episode. Now, if you're into crypto and Web3 and you enjoy this episode, I need two things. Subscribe, like, comment on this video so we can go ahead and reach more people. And then two, check out our free daily newsletter. We send out a free daily newsletter Monday through Friday where we go ahead and go over everything Web3, crypto to make sure you're staying updated and educated about the space. Now, without any further ado, let's dive right into this. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode. Today we have Kevin Degods. I'll let you introduce yourself for the people who don't know you yet. What's going on, bro? Awesome. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So Kevin Degods, CEO of Dust Labs, um, and we power uh, a bunch of collections. Two of the ones that you would most know are Degods and Utes. And so all the software that's behind Degods and Utes um, that we that we built through Dust Labs, and then we allow that software to get used by other projects and brands uh, in the ecosystem. I, I said, bro, and I've, I'm like, I'm talking to like a veteran here, and I'm like, maybe that's kind of disrespectful. Oh, so man. let me ask you this: like, how do you feel, obviously, in a space where a lot of the people you are working with are like younger? Like, how's do you feel like some type of? Does it make you feel younger, older? Like, how, what's kind of your uh, take on that? It makes me feel energized. And I think like that is the way, like funny, my wife and I talk about this. Like, you know, I, I live, I live in the San Francisco area and I go to LA roughly every other week to be with the team where Frank and, and the rest of the guys live down in the house. And when I come back from that, I'm just kind of pumped. It's like, a, it's almost like a reinvigoration. And to me, it's two ways. I think one, when, when I was young, when I was in, you know, my late teens and early twenties, um, you you spend a lot more time just really going deep and having a lot of focus. You don't have a lot of the distractions and um, and sort of real life happens. You know, when you're in your 40s, you've had a lot of things go on and you have a lot of different responsibilities, family, kids, wives, and things like that. And when you're in your 20s, you don't, uh, generally speaking. And um, what I noticed is like, you know, I, when I was in my 20s, I would go work and sleep, you know, under my desk and work 18 hour days and like, you know, sleep for a few hours, wake up in the morning and do it. And like, I found that like, you know, later on in life, like that didn't, I don't do my best work that way. The code I wrote at three, four in the morning, wasn't that great that the ideas and the decisions we made. Um, but the work going back to that sort of hacker house mentality of sort of like work, live, sleep, and like, is kind of cool. And like the way that the house is set up down in LA is it is that, you know, a bunch of guys live there. And, you know, people that are visiting that live in other places will travel in and when you're in that mode, sort of locked in, as Frank calls it, um, it's incredible how much we can get done. You really have this really deep collaboration, um, but it's incredibly inspiring. Like, and I work a different model. Like I get up, I'm an early bird. I wake up four or five in the morning. I'll go to Barry's in the 5.30 or 6.30 class there in Venice. Barry's, um, yo. And I get back and like fr Frank's still on spaces, like 6 a.m., 7 a.m. And then we sort of do our one hour handoff. He kind of like, you know, goes to bed and then I go to work. I do a lot of like sort of the business BD type meetings, investor things like that from the sort of like 8 a.m. to or 7 a.m. kind of Pacific to like noon, noon, one o'clock. You know, the, the team starts getting a little more active. Like here, what is it? Four o'clock Pacific now as we're talking. 
like Frank sort of just booting up. We just had our handover. We sort of do a morning and night handover where we discuss like things that are important. Hey, there's this legal thing you need to look at. I need a paragraph for investors on this. Um, hey, here's some spaces I did. Here's some stuff I talked about. And then inversely in the morning, I was like, hey, I'm going to go on some spaces. He's like, oh, here's the current topics of what people have been asking. Right. And so for us, um, it works really well. And we almost work two shifts in a sense, like in the way that we think about that. Um, but yeah, to your original question, like I think energize, it's just like the energy that comes from working with sort of like youth is incredible. And I, and I think it locked to like when you have kids, like they ask questions that at one level don't make sense, but at other levels are so broad and like unfettered and like, well, like, why is this that? And you're like, oh, that's a good question. Like I, I could give my like, uh, insecure sort of answer of like I know some of the reasons and why that like your second level question doesn't make sense but the fact that you can not have those constraints in your thinking I think is pretty pretty powerful um, and I think a lot of the success that the community that built around D gods and then Utes was that the constraints of how things used to be don't don't apply right and and that can be both from the way we communicate to the way we think about how we build product or how we actually go operate. Um, and I think that's very freeing. I bring a much more structured sort of linear approach of like, hey, this is the things we have to do. We have to check these seven boxes. And, you know, it's a good sort of yin and yang match, but but definitely uh, energizing is the way I would describe it. That's awesome. And I want to talk about a lot of those things that you bring, obviously, from your experience. But yeah, I couldn't agree more with you on on those topics, especially as like we see the space and it's like everybody in it or all the builders in it are so young where you do lack that veteran, that experience, that even like life experience, right, for founders. And you're starting to see now like these projects that are winning are those who are reaching out for that veteran experience with people who have a long life cycle in the web, in the technology industry. So they're coming in and they're helping and they're bringing, you know, the things that are missing. Um, I want to talk about obviously something you probably tired of talking about, but it's the talk of the town and it will continue to be so until obviously it happens. At what moment did the first initial thought of Degons and Utes moving to Polygon and ETH happen? And what was kind of the reasoning behind it? Yeah. So the, the move for Degods to ETH, you know, the first inkling of that inside the team came up probably a month after Degods launched, right? And if you go back oh, wow. to some of the really early discussions and things, like there's, you know, tweets out there that Frank's like, we're going to flip board eight. And mm. flipping board ape always meant you can't flip board ape without doing one to one. Like if I say, oh, I flipped them, it's like saying, you know, I'm a you know privately listed stock and I flipped the market cap of somebody on NASDAQ. Like that, yeah. that yes, but not not really, right? Like there was an asterisk, a hard asterisk. And so yeah. while there was days where D gods, you know, flipped collections on ETH and floor price or flipped collections by volume or trading and all those things we always knew that there was a hard asterisk on that and that the real, there was going to be a day that for D gods to sort of have a legitimate say of like, Hey, we're going after you we're going after board apes and we want to build like the best NFT, the best project, you know, no asterisks like that had to be on mainnet ETH. That's where the, you know, blue chips of blue chips existed. And so for D gods in particular, that was originally there. The idea of Utes was to say, Hey, look, we can launch a second collection. And that one also can do well. And a lot of projects hadn't had that success rate, right? Where many projects had a great first launch and did well. But the second collection was always sort of treated as a baby collection, you know, mm -hmm. something that never was respected and like sort of was like not even relevant, right? In, yeah. in the broader sense, other than to the holders, it sort of was like a little bit of a like, hey, it's like the little baby, the little brother. It's like right? version two, like nobody wants it pretty much. Yeah. That's how the it's, it's, just, it's just less less attractive, right? Yeah. And so we wanted to disconnect as much of that as we could with youths. And I think we took, you know, we got a lot of the things there. I could say, give us ourselves a seven and a half or eight out of 10. Like we didn't get the feminine traits enough. It's still more masculine than it could have been. We're fixing that with D God season three. Um, and then I think, but it did solve for brand safe, right? Like I can advertise pacifiers and do a collab with a pacifier company or Sesame street vibes. There's no cigarettes, no weed, no like sticks, no nothing. It's just very clean art, like very mm -hmm. simple, like clean, tight palette. And that was something that was important. So the idea of that collection staying on Solana was sort of like, Hey, if D God's most to eat, you know, 
Ute stays on Solana. And then, you know, as we started to talk about more publicly and, and saying, hey, DGods is going to move, um, we started to get a lot of outreach from other chains, right, you know, transparently, and had some incredibly big offers, like many, many times, like multiple times the offer that we ended up taking from Polygon. Um, and at first, we were like, oh, we're not interested, not working. And then the thing that, you know, at the end of the day, like what the decision was for us is that if you think of what the ecosystem is, we have D-Labs with the NFTs, we have Dust Labs with the software, and we have Dust the token. And for us to sort of continue to grow, we knew that like even Dust Labs always like the, a pitch was not like, hey, how can we build the best software for NFT projects? Like that's what our website token is. Like that's, mm -hmm. the, like, that's phase one. But the real thing is how do you build software for brands for web for that are outside of web three? How do you make web three 10 X a thousand X 10,000 X bigger? Mm -hmm. And for us, that was brands. You had to get outside of that loop. And so for us to do that, we have to reach brands. And so as we were talking to lots of brands with Utes and as we were getting with reward center in the last couple months of the year, talking about these brands, Hey, where are you launching? What are you doing? Like, what's your interest in web three? Um, Polygon kept came up, coming up, right? Like, hey, we're doing something with Polygon, either unannounced or already announced. We talked to brands that sort of looked at both and made a decision. And, you know, and I think the Polygon guys would agree, like, they, they've, they've signed a lot of deals. A lot of those deals haven't come to fruition and don't have the, like, at least crypto Twitter or virality of interest that you see from, like, the PFP projects and things like that. Mm -hmm. And the Polygon guys are like, we realize that we missed that community aspect to make these collaborations successful. You can't just take a Web2 brand and just put some blockchain on it and say like, whoop, check the box, we did it. Like to really get the full effects of like creator economy, Web3 ownership and like, you know, community, you have to build that as a sort of ecosystem. And yep. they sort of said, hey, we're gonna go do gaming with all these side chains, which is great, right? Because it gives you more scale. Like everybody knows that like you can't run the world's transactions. Like if you look at all databases in the world, like there's just no way like any blockchain can support that. Mm -hmm. Any L1, Vitalik, mm -hmm. all will say that like, and so Polygon's approach is like, hey, we're gonna launch a bunch of L2s, these kind of scaled side chains to allow each application to have their own way of scaling. Um, but that again, is just a technology play. It doesn't bring the community aspect. It doesn't bring the excitement that we've come to know with DGods and Utes and how, and like the community and the connections, both in real life and in line and having, you know, videos or conversations like this. And so when we, when Polygon came to us and they're like, look, they, we, they, they're like, we made a mistake. Like we want to be into PFPs. We want to be into community. And that, like, we think that is where we're going to focus on 2023. Not just like, hey, we're thinking about like, we missed that checkbox. It's like, no, no, we want that to be our focus. Because they've done well in DeFi. They've done well in gaming. They've done well scaling Ethereum. Um, and so that to us just fit, right? From a like, okay, that makes a ton of sense. We're going to go after that from a community thing. And then for us, it was like, well, like, if there's brands that have already launched, you know, Nike with Swoosh, you know, Starbucks, right? You can go down the, the, the list of them. Um, that have, and a lot of these have been bought with credit cards. Like this is like the ultimate yeah. like onboarding, right? Like people just come in and buy sort of like NFTs or tokens or loyalty points with credit cards. It's not a crypto thing. And so they're the ones that are honestly really onboarding a lot of new people on yeah. in a very direct way. Um, and for us, it just made a bunch of sense of saying, okay, can we take our launch pad, which we were planning to launch this year and have that launch things that then are very quickly tied to brands it sort of just made sense. They already had a really good head start on the brand side. Um, they have enough of the scalability stuff figured out. Um, and quite frankly, a pretty blank canvas in terms of building community and a lot of the sort of PFP projects, right? Like there's definitely some there that are out there. Uh, they just don't have any of the attention or any of the sort of the size of the community that you know Solana and ETH have. And so for us, that was what finally made the decision at the end. It wasn't about the money. Uh, you know, incompleteness, like sure it helps, like that's going to be great for D-Labs to have, you know, be able to build a team, do better content more often, right? Give Frank some scale back, um, be able to fund, you know, more on the artist side to be able to fund some of the work that we have to do on the launch pad. But the big thing was like, there's an existing uh, set of brands that are announced, a bunch that are not announced, that are now coming in at scale. Um, and there's this sort of opportunity to, to really, you know, help build an ecosystem of a community. And it really felt like that was a good match for the launch pad and, and why we made the decision that we made. 
Yeah, so pretty much what I'm getting is you guys would have made the move without getting the offer that you guys got offered. It wasn't about the money. It was more so about the long-term jeopardy is like, hey, Polygon built a lot of great things already on their blockchain, but they were missing the one thing that we all noticed, which is like actual Web3 culture, yeah. right? And that's where you guys thought you could fit in. Yeah. And I think, like I said, the, the money just accelerated it, right? We're able to build the team. We're able to go and achieve goals quicker because like we're able to like, you know, if we would have said, hey, we're going to go over there and do it like when we have time and kind of as funded, it would have probably taken six months, right? To go do a lot of the things we wanted to go do. Um, and now we're sort of targeting, you know, doing that inside of three months. And so, you know, optimistic, like, you know, always opportunity for a delay. Um, yeah. <laughs> but the goal is to sort of get it done in, in you know, by the end of Q1 um, and, and, you know, and then really just scale from there. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Now, Kevin, let's go into a little bit about you. And then I want to go right back into uh, obviously getting into the trenches of dust. So uh, for the people who don't know, obviously, who you are, I personally read a little bit. Can you tell us more about your experience coming from Silicon Valley, obviously, into Web3 and now leading one of the biggest, I guess, you know, uh, how do I call it? Technology innovation companies in the space. Yeah, cool. No. So I grew up on a pig farm in California, middle of uh, Central Valley, uh, went to L.A., at UCLA for school. Um, graduated in, you know, sort of 99, 2000, right when the internet was really kicking off the whole kind of first dot-com era. Um, and, you know, went to school as a mechanical engineer and so wanted to build airplanes and cars. Um, but in college, sort of the you know, first sort of like hot-wired internet connection was, wow, this software thing's awesome. And, you know, uh, talking to folks that are building cars and airplanes, they build a few cars and airplanes for their career where, you know, looking software, I'm like, man, I can edit a web page and ship it tonight and edit it and it was, and even back then, it was way harder to build things than it is now. Like we didn't have all the, you know, AWS and things like that yeah. and stuff. Um, but yeah, that that was sort of my first dip into software. Um, so I worked at a startup there, actually in college. Uh, moved to back to Silicon Valley in the Bay Area. Uh, been here about twenty two years, building companies, um, mostly leading the engineering side. So either starting companies or running large engineering teams. So you know, start small, five ten people build it up, you know, gets acquired, scale that, and then run, you know, multi-hundred person engineering teams, um, primarily in the email and collaboration space. So building a lot of tools around MMS, some of the early picture messaging stuff, and then email, calendar, and things of that nature. Uh, last was a mobile app called Accompli um, that we sold to Microsoft that became Outlook. And so if you have Outlook on your phone and, you know, Exchange or whatever, that, that iOS app. And so I ran engineering for iOS, Android, and Mac when I was at Microsoft. Um, so global team, hundreds of engineers. Um, which was ex exciting and very cool. Um, but to me, my passion is really that early sort of formative stage. Um, so left Microsoft to start another company that got acquired. Uh, we joined Instacart um, and then scaled Instacart uh, through the pandemic and did a lot of work on the fulfillment and sort of back inside. So, you know, just as when, you know, we were sort of building the team there, like Insta like the world shut down with COVID and then, you know, sort of grocery delivery or the need for sort of at-home grocery delivery went parabolic and a uh, really interesting time to be part of that. And, um, and you know, hired like 1.5 million shoppers in like five weeks, those first weeks of COVID all through the phone. Like it was just a really incredible time and, and really fun to scale. I think we had like 50 some engineers when I got there and when I left the 1400 or something. So like crazy scale in like those three or four years and uh, a lot of fun. And Met Frank uh, during that time when I was at Instacart. Uh, he was also at UCLA, obviously a lot younger. Uh, they were starting a company. And uh, so, yeah, we connected uh, through a kind of an alumni event uh, nice. at an investor's backyard. And, and, you know, he was running a different company at the time. And then, you know, he started, you know, crossed over into crypto. I had been playing with crypto in the early days, like, you know, crypto kitties and some of the like really fun stuff. More is just the, you know, I was just interested in the technology, never really worked in it uh, or did anything, you know, too um, material. Um, but the idea of like, as D gods and Utes were going along, constantly talking to Frank and just being around and then realizing that with, with Utes, there was going to be a lot of reuse of the same technology. And I was like, wow, like this may be an opportunity to really turn this into something bigger. And so we came up with the idea for Dust Labs to spin out like the technology team and build not only for like the D labs, D gods and Utes, but also for other projects. And then eventually we felt that, you know, that that's going to map really well to where we think, you know, one of the bigger opportunities in Web3 is around brands and, and uh, sort of CRM and marketing and things of that nature. Yeah. Let me ask you this, because from, from a financial perspective, right, I'm assuming you probably didn't have to do this, right? Because after what you did with Instacart, obviously, VP of engineering at Microsoft, 
right? So I'm guessing it was more so an interest thing, right? From you to leave what you've already built and been doing for a long time and leading that into coming into Web3, into a startup, into something that could have ultimately failed, right? Yeah. Very quickly as well with the whole space. So what would you say would have been like, was that driving factor to be like, you know what? I'm willing to take another risk at this point in my life when I don't really need to. I think it's always been that way. I mean, for 20 years, it's like start a small company or be, join a small company. It gets acquired. You work at a big company, leave that relatively cushy job like that you could literally retire at. I was at yeah. Yahoo, at VMware, at Microsoft and like, you know, all great companies, you know, maybe Yahoo, not so much like at the time. But um, <laughs> like, you know, again, like they were they were very secure job, like very good jobs, well paying jobs. But to me, it was always like that. Go back to the startup and, and build again, because I really enjoy that part of it. I, I, I like the solutioning of like, how do you solve a business problem and use technology mm -hmm. as a tool, right? And like, if you think of it in that super like abstract way, mm -hmm. um, I, I love that. I, I enjoy that game. It energizes me. And so to me, when, when I looked at this, it was like the opportunity to really do something here and sort of start over in a space with, you know, quite frankly, not a lot of rules figured out, um, a really direct relationship. Like I enjoy these kind of conversations. I enjoyed, you know, I always said in my other teams, I loved running the support team in addition to the engineering team. And it was always weird. Cause like, the, why is the support run under engineering? And I was like, well, I just really enjoy doing support because that is the most direct connect connection with customers. Mm -hmm. That's the most direct way to get feedback. And so web three was sort of designed for me in that sense. Like it has like, I have enough DJ in me that I like that sort of like, you know, figure it out as we go. How do we try it? How do we take risk um, with the notion of like building software to scale it and have repeatable sort of, um, you know, results that you can predict over time. Um, and then just a space that clearly has a lot of opportunity and growth, right? We don't know how this is all going to end and yeah. play out. I think going back a year from now or two years from now or in 2017, when it was all the ICOs and CryptoKitty kind of, thing, you know, early versions of that, um, you know, so many things have changed, right? And I think yep. uh, for me, it's just like that sort of rate of change uh, provides a lot of opportunity for people that are quantitative, right? Like I used to play online poker, right? And back in the early days when online poker was really popular, like anybody with sort of a reasonable quantitative sort of edge can like play and, and make good money playing like 25 cent, 50 cent dollar tables online, six, eight, 10 tables at a time. Um, and that was fun, right? And like when that ended... Like cause when they said, hey, you know, that's not going to be legal in the U.S. You only got to be in certain states. And so I was in California. I couldn't play anymore without like crazy VPNs and like pre prepaid phone cards. It like was wild, right? How you had to get money into these accounts in the end, full tilt poker and party poker and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I found sort of affiliate and sort of online marketing. And, and that was just a way that I sort of scratched that creative itch. And Web3 is sort of that perfect mix of like growth marketing, growth engineering, you know, really scalable things that on day zero, you go public, both from a financial point of view, because everybody can see everything on the blockchain, but also from a like, you don't get a like, hey, we're going to go to beta and do a slow start. You launch a mint, you get botted by the entire internet, right? That has yeah. interest in this thing. Um, and all those were just really fun technical problems to solve um, that I was attracted to. And I think just the idea of art and community and music and that just kind of makes it even more fun. Yeah, absolutely. And I've heard a lot of founders, obviously, off camera say like, hey, Web3 is actually very stressful and eats up your life away. At any point since you've gotten into this space, have you like been like, oh, I wish this wasn't as front facing to the community as it is right now? I mean, I have like there's been moments where you're like, oh, you got to put the phone down and just like log off Twitter because you're like, I am somebody that I'm inbox zero. So I like, I run everything down. I respond to every DM. I respond yeah. like, or at least read it. Like if it's garbage, like, look, there's a lot of people that reach out. They're like, hi. And I'm like, all right, dude, I don't have time. Yeah, I'm not going to be like, Oh, what do you want? Hey, how are you? Are yeah. you? It's like, so if you know, somebody's like, Hey, can I, can I get two minutes? No. Like, but if you tell me what you want, like, Hey, I want to do a podcast and video and here's my thing. And here's my link. All right, cool. I'll go do it. Like I'll respond. If it's make it easy for me, I'll make it easy yeah. for you. Um, and so I do live a lot in these apps and, you know, whether it's Telegram or Discord or, um, or Twitter or, or Slack, which is the internal thing we use for teaming. And so like that, I'm always driving it to like no badges, zero. And like that is an anxiety driven thing that I enjoy. Um, I think Web3 produces an amount that's, un, you know, there's no way I could go through and reply to every tweet and every single thing. Um, I think Twitter does a pretty good job of elevating the pieces of that to help me mm -hmm. find like, the most interesting pieces. 
Um, but to your point of like, do I ever want to just like, uh, like put it all back in the box and like close Pandora's box and go back to my like happy world? Um, I, I don't think about it in that sense. I think about it as like, I, I you know, I'm like, how can I do better to manage my time and approach this in a smarter way? Like I'm mm. pretty religious around my sleep. I go to bed relatively early. I wake up four or five in the morning. Like I have my routine and like, but I protect that seven, eight hours of sleep every night. Um, because I, that's my performance enhancing drug. Like that is my thing that like keeps me fueled. And like, especially as I've gotten older, I've realized that sleep is just that incredible. Um, and so, yeah, you don't find me on spaces at two in the morning, local time. Uh, you find me on spaces at five in the morning, <laughs> local time, which is 8, 8 a.m., you know, Eastern or something like that. Um, but yeah, so I think to me, it's like, I like, I love the feedback, even if it's really hard at times to, to deal with. Um, now, walk me through... Again, like, because I've never really talked to any, well, I have talked to people, but I don't think a lot of people in crypto understand like what it means, right? To manage a team of 100 people on the tech yeah. side, especially for an app like that relies on technology itself. Like Instacart, when you think about it, I can just imagine all the back end work that needs to happen in order to have a front end as smooth, as operatable as possible. So walk me through how those skill sets or like, what are the first things that when you came into dust and the D gods ecosystem, you're like, okay, here's the first X, Y, and Z checkboxes that I had to bring in from corporate to make this project feel like a company. Yeah. So I think the, the boring stuff that nobody ever talks about, is like a lot of lawyers and a lot of accountants, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, structure, especially when you raise a VC round, you need to have the right sort of legal structure and you're going to go through audits and sort of like diligence from various parties. Um, so I think there's a lot of what I would call just general corporate governance or housekeeping that you need to do to set up things right, uh, share grants and things of that nature and, you know, corporate, you know, overhead of like registering entities and creating that set of thing. So I think that was like one thing It's like always start with like, hey, that's the foundation of any business is like, do you own it? And do you, is it registered? And is it correctly set up? Yeah. And, you know, how do you do, you know, accounting and taxes and all that stuff? Um, and so I think, the other thing is then you come up the next layer, which is how do you make sure people are on proper payroll? And so like, you know, we're not paying people in crypto anymore. We're not paying like, you know, hey, we're going to put a payroll system in and we're going to put in, you know, a proper way to hire and register people and like, you know, dox them, right? And set up yeah. healthcare, right? So people can, are not in there, you know, again, working with a lot of young team, like they don't need healthcare, right? They're all still on their parents' healthcare because they're either in college or adjacent out of college or they don't have healthcare because they're young and healthy. And when you're 20 and you go to 24-hour fitness every day, that works out, right? When you're older and you have kids and a lot of risks, like you need, you know, proper healthcare. And so to build a big team with hundreds of engineers, you're going to need that, right? Because somewhere along the line, you know, first two guys we hired, one came from Facebook, one was ex Google Pinterest. And like, they're oh, expecting wow. a full set of, build, of benefits. They're not going to be like, they have families or, you know, they understand like that model and they're going to want that to be the same. Um, and so I knew like, you know, for us to go hire those guys in month one, I need to set that stuff up in week one, right? And so those were like very base things. So, you know, fuel the team, you know, fuel the company, go capitalize the company, you know, set up the team and then, um, you know, and then, and then ensure that the pieces are there. We hired the team. We had everybody onboarded. Uh, I think we got the, you know, it took us about four weeks to sort of get to agreement on the, on the, on the fundraise, another four weeks to sort of finish that and sort of get all the checks in and all of the paperwork and legal stuff done. Um, and then for, and we, you know, I was hiring in parallel, um, and then we had everybody hired and onboarded on November 1st, you know, so four weeks wow. later. And so like, a lot of that was like, because sort of knowing the order of operations to walk those through and then set up some basic tooling, right? Like, Hey, what are we going to communicate in? Okay. We're going to, you know, email calendar, right? What are the, you know, really simple stuff, right? What you set up Slack, right? We set up all the rooms. Like that's kind of like, we're not using telegram and discord to communicate with each other. Like that's like the DJ way to talk. Like, no, we have to build like channels and rooms. Like this thing's going to, you can't do hundreds of people. I'm sure there are, there's communities that work in that way, but it's hard to keep accountability at the same level you can in something like a Slack or Microsoft Teams. You know, we chose Slack. Um, and then you set up things like Atlassian, like Jira and project tracking and, and, and how do you build sprints and like say, hey, this is what we're doing this week. And for the first, you know, I would say um, probably the first six weeks, we, we were just like setting up the systems, you know, setting up the various pieces of GitHub and, you know, go do the deal with AWS and Google and get the free credits and all that kind of stuff. Like a, a lot of stuff that like when you're small, it doesn't matter because the bills aren't that big. But when you're really big and you've not set up the right relationships and structured things, and I think you hire people that have experience. Right. And so like 
all three of our first, you know, three engineering hires outside of the people that were already working in DGODs were, you know, one gentleman worked in finance, uh, finance apps as a subsidiary of Walmart, right? And so built like right. FinTech stuff. So hardcore security auditing, like DevOps, like just an absolute shredder. Um, and then hired, you know, really good front end, uh, you know, dev from Facebook and then a or meta, and then a really strong back end computer science guy that had done, you know, Pinterest and Google. And again, all of that to say, hey, we need somebody to like really dial in all the infrastructure. We need somebody to dial in the front end. We need somebody to dial in like back end APIs. Guy learned Rust in a week. I'm like, hey, I go write this smart contract. He rewrote the entire like smart contract like after a week, like maybe two weeks. I guess he's finishing up. We're gonna go send it to audit. Like, so those kind of skill sets, they exist in Web3. Like there are people that have like picked up things mm -hmm. quickly, but um, most of, like when you hire engineers that have been at Silicon Valley companies for a decade and you get the right ones, like the speed of learning, like the tech, like learning a new language or learning a new is like a week or two. Like, and that generally is not something you see with a lot of self-taught folks. And honestly, you could argue a lot of my skill sets are self-taught on the technology side. I spend more time building and managing teams and hiring. And, um, like if you ask me to write code, it's probably not going to be beautiful, right? I haven't done that in a while. <laughs> Um, but you have to know what you don't know, right? And you have to bring in the people to fill those gaps. And so for me, it was like, fill the critical roles. You know, we you know, got a sales team, got VD. So we've checked all the boxes, got a really strong product lead that's done product and design, bring the designers on and really just understand like, what is that, you know, initial 10, I think we have 14 people now um, that are just going to make up the core of that team wow. that is going to sort of get everything running, oiled. And like I said, they were all onboarded within, you know, four or five weeks after we sort of finished the final fundraise. Um, and, you know, we started sort of operating sprints, like really like diligently, I would say in December in the last couple of weeks. And now like, now we're really set up to execute with 2023 and, and all the stuff we want to build. And so for me, it's like putting systems in place, right? And I think that's like the, if you had to zoom it out, like all that stuff I just said, um, mm -hmm is putting the systems in place that allow you to get things done. And they probably are a little harder and they cost a little more and they take a little more time, but they, you put that in place so that when you're at 10 people, it's like, okay, it's a little bit annoying to have to file a bug and write it and sign it. Like you, it feels like you're stamping the thing three times and you're playing, you're like, you're switching hats. You're like, I'm in this role, I'm in this role. But then pretty soon there's 10 people in those three roles and then without having any kind of tool or structure, it would have been really hard. And so you set yourself up so that like when you go from 10 to 20, from 20 to 40, 40 to 100, the tools don't have to change. Like it's just mm -hmm. another row in the HR database. It's another row in my sprint. Now I have two sprints. Oh, we have 100 people. Okay, that's like five sprint teams, you know, okay, like that. It just sort of like blocks out of how you scale. Um, and other things will change how you do coordination, product roadmaps, you'll have planning sessions and things like that, um, where now we can do it all in one or two meetings. Um, but, but I think it's really about putting the right systems in place. I love that. And I can completely relate to it. I mean, I come from an e-commerce background. I'm trying to do this media thing uh, for my first time here. And like, I was talking to uh, pretty much our Twitter manager and he was like, Hey, I, now I noticed what you did in the last four months, five months. Cause it's like, I hired eight people, but we're barely bringing in revenue, which is probably a bad idea. But I'm like, I hired eight people where now I know as soon as we start putting fuel on the fire, we can scale because it's just another Slack channel. It's another person, you know, on the Monday board, so on and so forth. So I completely love uh, what you just said. Now talk to me about this, right? So a lot of people don't know between D labs and obviously dust labs, the big difference. From what I know, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, D-Labs is more focused on the NFT side of things, right? To break it yeah. down very simply and on the utility of the actual projects and producing more projects. Then Dust Labs is about producing tech, innovation, software, right? For NFT and Web3 companies. Now, over the last year, I would say, right? I personally have seen a lot of people try to develop a lot of software or tools for NFT companies, projects, but they all kind of come out to be copy-paste, you know, rinse, wash, and repeat. It's like you haven't really seen any type of innovating software, right? So for you guys, when you think about Dust Lab specifically as well, I guess this is another question here. Uh, long term, what type of software infrastructure are you actually thinking about? Like, is it, are we thinking like Magic Eden or trader type software, or like how to build a collection faster? Or are we talking about like next level stuff, which I don't even know what I'm thinking about? Yeah, no, it's a good question. And it's one we get a lot and people are like, do you, what have you guys actually built? You just have a couple of websites. And, um, and I think when you zoom out, like 
the beauty of technology is that you don't see it. Right. Yeah. And so when things are really smooth and really smooth and, and like clean and it just works and it just butters buttery, like you don't notice it. You just click the button, you see a nice animation, it transitions, it works. And you don't like that. And that's what simplicity is actually hard to build. Yeah. And I think that piece, a lot of people underestimate is like, oh, of course, we could have just went to like a, a website to upload our images and then just kind of like a use a no code thing and then use like, you know, Gitbook or Notion is one of the things to our website. Don't build a full thing. Oh, the Utes Mint, you really didn't need to write like this tube thing and have the animation come down and play the music. And like the guys spent hours on that to time the animation, different browsers, different refresh rates to get how long the song was. When does it repeat? Like, and, and again, like, is that innovation? No, but it was pretty delightful, like the way that mint worked and like it worked, right? Like it didn't get yeah. hot, it didn't come down. Like there was no, you know, technical issues with it. Um, and that's hard. And so you, the, the first question is that you asked was like a structure one, which is like, yeah, if you think about it simply, like D Labs sort of has the artists and the community, right? Like that is sort of like the people that work for that are the artists yeah. and the community managers. Dust Labs is the engineers, right? Frank sort of bridges across both, you know, in a marketing type role. And really that's the, the magic of the two entities t working together is that the NFTs generate a lot of attention, a lot of hype, but they do that because what Frank is promoting is software that works really well. That's delightful and different. Right. And mm -hmm. again, I wouldn't say unique, right? It's not like we're like the first one to do a mint. We're not the first one to do, you know, the scholarship Ute list thing. Lots of people have done different ways of whitelist management and that like it's been out there for a year. But we did yeah. it in a way with a little bit of virality. Now, there's been tons of copycats, right? The application yeah. meta got overplayed and there's tons of them out there. And, you know, we're going to launch a new version here and, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll be on, e, you know, EVM chains as well here in a couple of weeks. And um, we're going to add a few new things to it and it'll be fun. But I think that's really what we think about with Dust Labs is like the, the, the vision is like, what does it take to make it really easy to make Utes and D-Gods go viral and for the community to really love what we do? Right. And so if you think mm -hmm. of that as the goal, like product market fit for like Dust Labs on a day to day basis is like, are we building things that make the community happier from like holders and both, you know, perspective holders, right? Like, you know, people that aren't holders yet, but could be. Um, and are we building that in a way that it's reusable? Right. Because the idea is that if we, you know, create things for events or create things for clubs and sub DAOs. And like, you know, the, U the U Utes has this cool clubs notion. It's really sub DAOs. Like people have had sub DAOs from ever, yeah. but like they've never been presented like that hung off a nice website. And like, you know, you have like literally instant clubs forming and people were like jumping up to form traded based clubs on like on the first day right after mint. And it was like, wow, that w sort of was by design because we made the traits really easy to sort of like have no rarity. And that was a lot of code, right? To, to figure out how to do no rarity with perfect distribution um, was actually harder than, you know, we spent hours on it um, and uh, you know, it was kind of cool. But I think for us, like that, that sort of process of, of innovating in a sense of trying to make something simple and delightful, but then building it in a way that a third collection could come along, whether that's ours or someone that we partner with and we can launch it and they can get all that for, you know, for free. Right. Like it's sort of just mm -hmm. like, we figured out a bunch of that for them. And so like projects like when ASICs launched on scholarships, um, Coda is out there now, which is incredible. And they added a really cool feature. It's like a music NFT. And so like you mm -hmm. go through and it actually does like a Spotify pre-save as part of the application. Right. Nice. Again, pretty awesome. Right. Because now the artist is actually getting pre-saves for the song, which is going to make a huge difference when that song drops, you know, as part of the sort of application process. Um, but as you look at those pieces, right, and then, you know, Honeyland is a really cool game on Solana. They've launched on, they were one of the, they were the first scholarship customer to go live. And, you know, seeing that work for them in a slightly different way with their guest list, but, you know, achieve the same goal, which was how do you sell your mint out quickly? How do you build a, a vetted community of beta testers for their game? Um, worked out really well. And so I think when we think about, you know, the things that we're trying to build for Dust Labs, it's like, how do we use Utes and D-Gods as sort of beta customers for the, you know, trying it out? And like you said, there's lots of stuff out there in the market today that's being built for, for creators, for traders, for whatever. And our view is that like our job is to think of the creator as the marketing or comms person in a brand, right? If you think about Frank, he's really running a brand, right? Yeah. Now, his brand could be a coffee brand. It could be a burrito brand. It could be a shoe brand. Um, and he would have this like really like 
rabid sort of like dedicated and really like passionate community tied to his brand. The brand happens to be the gods or happens to be youths. And the tools that we give him to do that and make that easier allows him to, to build the brand bigger and more awareness and more virality and more sort of passion from those holders and more value to that community, right? So now think of like giving that same tool set to a nightclub owner, to a burrito company, to a shoe company, to a golf company, right? Like, and saying, hey, I want to sell golf clubs or golf balls or whatever. And I want to have that same level of dedication and community and ownership of the product. And when I drop a new release, people are excited for it. And they're, you know, they get early access and there's token gating. Or you think of in the music industry with ticketing and like, you know, experiences with merch and content. Um, and then, you know, access to uh, events, whether those are concerts or, or parties or something like that. And so as we think about what we're building today, the idea is that making the job easy to make Utes and D-Gods really great communities, we think will naturally lead into other brands wanting to build amazing communities around their brands that are not Web3 native, right? And this is, like I said, this is bringing Web2 brands and why we think the, the Polygon thing is pretty exciting is that a lot of those brands are already sort of raising their hand and saying, I would like to come, you know, participate in Web3 and access those communities and and access the tooling that sort of makes that better, right? Fractional ownership, instant trading, all, loyalty on chain, mm -hmm. things of that nature, right? And so that to us um, is how we think about Dust Labs is like, it's a lot of times like people are like, well, wait, aren't you guys just building stuff for D-Gods? Like, how is that useful for like, why is that a good company or a good idea? And the reason is that we want that to sort of parlay out to be ways that we can adapt that to use that for brands, right? And so some of those may be the very the same way that Utes and D-Gods uses it with launching an NFT collection. Others may be more tangential where it's like just building rewards and loyalty and things of that nature. Yeah, I love that. Now we've seen like, um, what's it called? I think Sappy Seals, right? Well, at least the AI meme generator, right? So when I look at that, I'm like, wow, that's actually pretty dope tech and it's on par and it's on time, right? As soon as AI comes. So for somebody like you, obviously, you know, CEOing a tech and obviously like technology company in general, like when you see that, what is your reaction? And is there something that maybe you can tease us about in terms of like, hey, we're actually dabbling with AI too and the d guys and the youth community can look forward to something cool? Yeah, so it's funny, like uh, Frank and I have been communicating in chat GDP lately, you know, we've been like running them back and forth and, and prying out different prompts and stuff and sending each other screenshots of what we were able to write. Like he's been responding to his emails in it and like different texts and DMs and stuff. It's been pretty fun to like watch like that and then, hey, make it my voice and, and clarify it. And it's incredible. So I think for us, like we're definitely in the experimentation phase with it. Look, I've been around like AI and ML. Like we used a ton of that at Instacart, right? For whether mm -hmm. for ad matching, we used it to figure out the best routes for shoppers. How do we optimize which store? How do we order the frozen stuff to be at the end so that it doesn't, you know, it goes in the cart last? And like, but how do you build the right track? So you would look at the fastest shopper through a store and you would take the top 10% of shoppers and the way that they ordered the items and then build a correlation back wow. to generate it for a random shopper. Um, so like those to me are like, the AI is only as good as the data you put into it and like, and the use case. And so, you know, I think, and look, and you know, we've launched some meme ish type stuff. Like we've launched like the NFT blue, which was like, Hey, let's go support creators and like, you know, get royalties back on knowing that there's going to be a enforcement, but just trying to solicit like attention. And that one honestly didn't probably work as well as we would have hoped. Um, but I do think that like, we try to pick a balance of things that like more often can be reusable. Right. And so like, yeah building things that are more novelty are good for attention in the brand. And I think that's fun and we will build some of those, but we're always like, how would the CMO at a fortune 50 company leverage this tool? Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, scholarships, it's like, great. They're going to do some amazing new beta. If they can run it through a Ute list, like scholarship program to really curate the right, you know, 50 or a hundred people out of like, you know, imagine Procter or Gamble or Coke or Pepsi, like opening up, like saying, hey, we have this really incredible like 100 person beta. You know, they're going to get tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people to apply. How do they figure out who are the right people? Like that's sort of what we had to solve with Utes, right? And yeah. so we think that software again, will, or that something like that. And you asked about like, what's the longer term vision? I think it maps back to that, which is like, it, you know, it's a sales force, it's HubSpot, it's, you know, things that allow like a lot like Hootsuite and a lot of the tooling that allows social media to be useful by brands today. Like most brands that run like a big Twitter account, 
don't log in through the mobile app and just tweet, right? Like they do a little bit. Yeah. They run it through a dashboard. They have a bunch of like, you know, yep. multiple agents tagging them, replying to them. It's like a community, you know, they have a, they have a team, right? Um, and so we think of a lot of the software that we build as like, what is the team version of that or the team view of that? When like 10 people from the marketing department of a Fortune 50 brand want to go operate an NFT project, what does that look like? And like, we take it from that thing. And so I think, you know, AI for them is like, how does it make them more efficient? How yep. does it make them, uh, you know, better at their job? And, and as you think about that for us, it's like, well, how can we build sort of automation into like a lot of the things like, you know, Finn always does these really cool tests. Like he did one earlier today where it was like the first 1,000 retweets get 69,000 bonk tokens, right? Uh, you know, it's kind of on par with the meme today, right? And it's like using Hey Wallet, right? Like, but like that kind of thing, pretty cool, going to go viral, you know, whatever, it gets a lot of retweets. Um, but like constantly thinking of those ideas and having a menu of like interesting things that you can do on Twitter that like can keep the community engaged and having fun, like and having a library of those that can just kind of like, be like, oh, go grab an image, go grab this text, write a little content and ship it out. Like, that's kind of cool, right? And so those are the kinds of things that when we think about like applying AI to or just general automation, because really, if you think about it, really computer code in general, like all these are versions of like artificial yeah, intelligence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Give the computer a bunch of instructions, it goes and executes those, you know, in a relatively rigid manner, you know, open AI and some of the new stuff they're doing there allows you to have like even, you know, less context to even get more output, right? Like I can really give it a small amount of coaching to say, Hey, you know, draw me a picture with this person, you know, of this tone and in this setting on this day with that night in watercolor or whatever. And it can generate like pretty cool stuff. Um, and so I think while the novelty of that is pretty amazing and some of the stuff we've seen is incredible, it's like, well, how do you apply that to like making, the job of running an NFT community, or again, broadly, if you take NFT out of it, a community, right? Because that's where we think the power mm -hmm. of this, like building passionate communities around brands. Um, and, and we think that is, you know, one of the big parts of the future. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when it comes to Dust Labs, right, your main customer as a business is big businesses. And we have two companies from what I'm getting here, right? And obviously, you guys raised, I think, what was it, a $7 million round? Yeah. Right. So, when you raise, obviously, a lot of people know there's profits, right? The profits are involved, aka the, the investor needs to see a, a return on profits. So it's like, what is the main way, I guess, that you guys see yourself getting to that profitable level? And I don't know if you can discuss numbers or not, but at what type of revenue numbers are we talking about for a company of the scale of where Dust Labs wants to be? Yeah. So I think, I mean, if you if you think about this in Web2 terms, like when you go raise a, you know, a few million dollar seed round, right? At those scales, like... It's really like betting on the team, the market, and the idea, right? Like, you, you know, and, and the more, you know, the stronger background the team has, the more successful time they've had, the more, you know, sort of like legitimacy that they've had in business and the more credible they are as a person. Like, is it the right team for the right market at the right time? Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of like early stage bets are very much that, right? Like, no. um, you know, and if so, if, you know, unnamed founder, first time, never done anything, you're going to require a lot more diligence in terms of like building, having more built or having something bigger. Um, and so in terms of how you, you know, sort of come up with like, why did you raise money or what is it? It's less about like how much money this company is making. Now, if you bootstrap something that's making a ton of revenue and it's going concern and, you know, you're unknown, like you're going to get valued based on the revenue and the growth rates and things like that, right? If you're, but most, you know, seed or pre-stage companies generally aren't valued on what they've built or the revenue. Now, as you fast forward out, the, the expectation is that you will build a business, right? And like, mm -hmm. um, I sort of think of this as like, there's kind of three levels of sort of success. There's like the super large, profitable, super hyper fast growing business, right? That goes IPO in, in a handful of years. And like, those are getting rarer and rarer, quite honestly, yeah, right? They're taking a long time to get there. Um, but they're building essentially three piles of value, right? There's building customers and revenue, like that's one. So right, you're going after a space and you're actually getting revenue in. I think the other one is interesting technology in a space. So you're becoming an expert in technology in a space and building technology and IP that you own. So intellectual property. And then the third is a team, right? And then you have the combination of those three. So 
a really good team with really good tech that's got a really good business. That's like the utopic right. thing and it's growing really fast. Like that's the banger. Um, you know, a lot of things can get valued and raise secondary rounds on just saying like, hey, we've built really good tech or we've built a really good team or we've got a really good like sort of run rate with customers, but need help on the team or need help on the marketing. Right. And so every one of these deals is a little different. Um, but when you look at like success of Dust Labs, you know, you fast forward this out, like you're going to be looking at multiples of like, well, what's this, what's Salesforce revenue trading at on the market? Like how many times multiples at 5X, you know, 10X, 11X, you know, what is the number, right? Um, and then you're going to get compared tangentially to things like Coinbase or other like, again, public companies that are in the space, right? And so for somebody like Dust Labs, where it's like, looks like a SaaS company, but it, today very much serving Web3 customers, the valuation is much more, blended off of SaaS and blended into like, where are crypto companies trading at? What are the mining companies trading at? Right. And like, let's be honest, they're all down right now. Yeah. Right. And so like valuations are, are suffering and you're seeing the, the rate of fundings at this point, a little slower than it was say six months or a year ago. And also the valuations on those rounds being lower. And that sort of, if you think about it is just backing down where if that company fast forwarded out 10 years and they were on some range of one of those three vectors of success, the company and they were public today, what would that be worth? Yeah. It's less than it was, you know, in the summer when all of crypto was pumping and people are raising it, you know, really, really valuations because the numbers were all going in that direction, right? And so I think the market's pretty rational, right? In, in that sense. And a lot of people are like, oh, it's so mystical. Like, I don't know, it's like it requires luck. And like, I, I think some, but a lot of it's pretty straightforward. Like how good is the team? How good is the idea? And I've told a lot of people this, you know, founders and, you know, that are going out, like quitting their big job and going to do startups or whatever. And when I mentor folks, I'm always like, if you take, you know, the salary that you make at your current job, and when you quit, if you can't raise a seed fund, you know, if, let's say the three founders all quit and they're all making $100,000 a year. If they can't raise at like 300K, like super bare bones minimum, like, they're probably something wrong with the idea of the market or their skill set for alignment with the market. And that's mm. just the truth, you know, because again, like if, if no, if no VC will literally even pay your salary for one year of your old salary, because you're probably going to take less and you're going to use that runway a little more efficiently. You probably just haven't, you're not convincing enough, right? That it's that good of an idea. And so, I, you know, and I've done this, I've been in pitches before of companies that I was going to found or, or going after and pitching where they're like, I think I'm pretty good at what I do, but they're like, ah, I'm not going to fund it. And then I'm like, okay, well, clearly it's, if it's either, it's either I'm not good for this market, the market's not believable at the time. They don't think it's worth that value. Um, or they're quite honestly, probably seeing better deals. Cause that's the other thing a lot of people don't think about is that, oh. you know, you're in for your 20, 30 minute pitch session, you know, busy seed investors or any kind of investors that are seeing 10, 15 pitches a day, right. At, at times, right. Or, you know, at least that many a week. And so they're pattern matching. They're like, oh, well, I look across the 10 or 20 deals that I did all week or looked at, and I'm going to pick the best one every other week, right? So yeah. like one out of 50 deals, I'm going to go down. And so they're judging you relative to what's on the market. And so a lot of times you're like, you could have an incredible idea for an incredible market and be an incredible team, but somebody that's an incredible plus plus or somebody that's already built that business or a version of it, or just a different business that's, you know, for whatever reason, more aligned. Because a lot of investors will be like, oh, I'm investing in enterprise, consumer, and crypto, or I'm investing in SaaS and this. They have like their sort of focuses and they're trying to balance their portfolio, right? They don't want, you know, unless they're a dedicated fund, they don't want all crypto, nor they want all SaaS, nor all enterprise or all consumer. They want to have a blend across, oh, we're looking at like medical and tech and, you know, healthcare or whatever. Um, and so when I think about like valuations and sort of like how we have to perform, like, our job, right, with this, you know, sort of the money we raised is to use that money efficiently to build out all three of those things the best we can, right? Which is mm -hmm. like, how can we build the best team with the best technology and the best sort of revenue and customer rate? And if, look, if we can't get best in all three of these, at least make a credible move in all three of them or find the one that where we're more efficient, like, hey, we're really efficient in investing in team and building a great team, or we're really efficient in building great technology. We need help on customer or whatever. And maybe, you know, these are startups you see them get, you know, merged in with other companies or, or closed down. You know, like there's other ways that this sort of plays out. Um, and so when I look at this, uh, you know, I, I just think about it as a relative game, but also like 
every day we wake up and we know that what our mission is of like, hey, we want to build software that's great for our sector. But we also are constantly looking at that because like if I just say, hey, we don't think of the bar as static, right? Yeah. If I am trying to build a SaaS company in crypto and I just shoot for, you know, September of last year when we you know did the round, like I'm not going to be successful when let's say a year from now we go out and raise another round. And I'm like, well, I built the best company from, you know, back in September of 2021 and they're in their 2022. And they're like, dude, like we're on 2023 numbers now. And this is what the current meta is. And they're all using AI or they're all using some other whizzy wig thing. Like you need to be able to adapt so that you time that when you get to the point that you need to raise more capital, go public, get acquired, whatever, that you've built the best for then. Right. And mm -hmm. sometimes that is a little bit of market timing and getting lucky and those kind of things. But I do think that's another area that you have to be willing to change, right? And, and willing to adapt because especially in a market like this, where it's moving very quickly, it, yeah. it's going to change a lot faster than you can build. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you very much on that. Now, my follow-up question is that is like, okay, you check three boxes, you build a great product, you have a great team and you're in a great market. How does that correlate to kind of the lingering thing that you guys have, which is not an NFT, right? It's not a revenue model. But it's the token, right? The dust token. So how does all of that kind of tie in? And what's kind of the utility behind that long term? No, it's a great question. And so when we think of dust, like, and that's one of the things that's cool with crypto is, right, you have different levers, right? Like in a traditional software company, you build company, you have a Stripe account, they, you know, put money yep. in it, you mm -hmm. register, like pretty static, like you have yeah. a couple things to work with. And so the idea of a token and like, look, everybody's got a different flavor of how they've approached it. But Dust was, you know, created as a utility token for DGOT holders, right? And so it was like the idea was how can we um, have a token that sort of ties for utility for DGOT holders? And then how, how can over time that, you know, be used for rewards, whether it's, you know, changing them for merch or getting things. We did the whole Ute Mint. So if you held your dust, you're able to get a free Ute, right, as part of the process. Um, and so in the future, we've, you know, our hope is to move away from some of the bigger bangs, sort of like, hey, do a mint, do an art upgrade only in dust. Like, we'll probably continue to do those. But like, the more interesting thing for us is like, how does dust become integrated into the software that Dust Labs is building, right? And so one of the best examples that's out there today is staking and rewards, right? So to stake your DGOD or stake your Ute, you pay one dust, right? To unstake it, you pay three dust, right? So pretty simple, right? But it puts constant sort of like utility and use for that yeah. token. And so if you're a DGOT holder and you've been around a long time, you can stake and unstake, move your DGOT around. You know, you that's for free. But if you're a new person, you come into the market, you need to acquire dust to sort of participate in rewards. And so, you you know, the old you know, sort of original DGOT holders that got dust, you know, by proxy get to participate in the utility of the software in that sense. Um, when we think of like um, the raffle side or things we've done with Dusties in the past or auctions, again, other use cases where, you know, people can use that. We had the DAO pool where other like DAOs were able to like yeah. contribute just in um, to get access to the Utes Mint. I think, you know, so uh, those are the kinds of things that we've done in the past. And, and our view is that we'll continue to look for ways to integrate that into what we build Um with a bias towards looking for ways to in, like think of dust as gas, right? Like that sort of mm -hmm. power, some of the like more frequent transactions on the dust lab software. And so you could imagine a world where maybe staking and rewards becomes free, right? For other projects to use, but then every time they stake or unstake, like, you know, they're sort of consuming dust or using dust, right? As an example, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we've seen Ape obviously with their whole staking mechanism right now, and everybody's kind of like on the on the line of like, is it gonna fucking blow? Is it gonna keep working? Like, how long is it sustainable for? So, do you guys ever see Dust being that big and that much of like a centerpiece of the ecosystem as a whole, or is it more so like, hey, let's just push it project for project and see where how it fits as we need it to? Especially yeah, as you guys go into obviously ETH and Polygon, like, is there gonna be yeah. utility there? No. So I think, I mean, we've announced, you know, on Christmas that dust will be going cross chain. So we're going to bridge it from um, Solana into, into ETH. And so you'll have it access, you know, into EVM chains broadly. So it'll be accessed on Polygon. It'll be accessed on ETH, which will again, make it useful for the staking contracts and things of that nature, rewards and whatnot. Um, so we think that you know, again, just growing the ecosystem, dust will stay the same. We're not going to print any more dust, like dust emissions run out here in roughly February. Um, and then at that point, that's it. 33 million dust. That's all that, that you know that will ever be printed. Um, and the idea for that, or emitted, I guess I should say, 
and then the idea for that is that we um, can then, as we build things and, and add things, the, you know, those will continue to accrue to people that hold it. I like to think of dust as like access to the NFT environment, right? So right. like you may not hold a D God, but you know, if you hold dust, you're sort of holding like one step closer to being like a D God right. holder or a part of the D labs interface. And so I think, you know, when you think about the ecosystem around D gods and, and a lot, like way more people hold dust than hold Utes and D gods combined, right? Yeah. Like more than five X. Right. And I think part of that is that are people, you know, are believing or want to be part of like the things that D gods have done or the things that Utes are going to do. Right. And I think as you think about those um, as sort of opportunities, you know, to, to both use the token, but also, um, but yeah, we don't have anything to announce today on like how it's going to work or what we're thinking about for like, you know, anything that looks like ApeCoin. But I think for us, it's really like, it was an NF, it was a very clean, you know, mint. Like there was no like team supply, no foundation, no like very fair release, right? It was literally a fair mint. Like all of the dust that was out there was earned by holders of the NFTs of D Gods. Um, the team got none. All of the dust that came back to the treasury was earned, right? From like art upgrades or from the Utes mint or things of that nature. And so we're, we, we think that was a lot of the, sort of early success of just, you know, that being a, a, a sort of a true utility token that didn't have any sort of bias in terms of like, there was no investors, no like carve outs or funny tokenomics. It was like super clean. And like Frank says, modeled after Bitcoin, right? With just super aggressive halvings, um, 33 million versus the 21 million. Um, but the idea being very much tied to like, hey, it's going to reward the people that are, you know, working in the D-God's world by staking their uh, D-God or dead God. I love that. And I know our time is coming to an end here, so I don't want to keep you over time. But for those who did stay all the way to the end, is there any alpha? Say today is January 20th. Let's just assume the date is on the 20th as people are listening to this. What news do you have for people who are alpha to kind of have them come into the ecosystem? And be yeah, it's so on the 20th. I think like one of the coolest things, I mean, like so the applications for uh, the NFT launchpad should be out, um, which will be pretty cool. And so uh, if not out, it'll be out very shortly. Uh, but the plan is to have it out before the end of January, uh, which will allow uh, projects, whether you're an existing project and want to launch a new one, or you're a new creator and a new founder and want to launch a project um, and have that be, um, you know, sort of launched by D Labs, the NFT accelerator and, and get coaching and, and all of the sort of things that come along with that um, will be pretty competitive. Like we're not going to launch a ton of projects. It's going to be relatively selective so that Frank can literally spend time and I can spend time with the founders, you know, in the early days on our, you know, one-on-one helping uh, Johnny's going to give advice on the art, you know, Delilah recently nice. docs our artist. And nope. so um, the idea there is that um, those projects can be, you know, uh, you know, really strong sort of coming out of the gate. Um, but also, you know, the access will be pretty sweet because it'll launch on, the rewards center, you know, through Utes. And so you can actually use your Utes points to mint an NFT, which is pretty cool, right? And so the idea that some portion of the supply will mint in, in points, um, we think is pretty exciting and, and different in the sense that, you know, it, it allows a creator to bring their project, not in a whitelist way, but in like a direct access way to people that, um, you know, are the most, uh, you know, loyal. They, they've staked their youth. They've been part of it. They, you know, they sort of diamond handed their NFT for a while and earned it. And we think that's a pretty exciting thing. And so we're pretty excited to see that roll out um, over, you know, the coming months. But, um, but yeah, we, you know, should be, the application should be out there. And so if you're thinking about launching a project or you have something in mind, would, you know, you should apply and would love to, we'd love to take a look. You heard the man, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, and make sure you guys drop a like, subscribe. We'll see you on the next episode. Kevin, thank you so much for uh, coming on. Of course. Thank you for having me.